This is Ellen Foley, and you are watching Heritage Musicians in Conversation with Joe Matera. And we're going to be talking about my new album, Fighting Words. You first worked with Meatloaf and Jim Steinman back in the uh, mid-1970s uh, on the National Lampoon tour. So just tell me a little bit about those early days with Jim and Meatloaf. <clears throat> it was a, um, a musical comedy review. National Lampoon is a magazine, a, a humor magazine, and they um, produced a couple of off-Broadway shows. There was National Lampoon Lemmings and then National Lampoon, uh, the National Lampoon show. And um, we did it on the road. We, it was a, it was a low budget tour. We were in a blue van driving around America. It was Jim, myself, and four other people, plus a stage manager and a driver, or maybe they were the same person, the stage manager slash driver. And um, it was it very um, sacrosanct. It was, uh, you know, um, like one, one, uh, sketch that I did with Meatloaf, I played this girl, she was very cheerful, this girl and, and she, she was blind and, and she was all very, um, all happy and, and, and her boyfriend came in and, 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 you know, she was, she was just such a wonderful girl, but he in the meantime was doing things like pretending he was her dog and humping her leg. And, you know, it, uh, so the humor was pretty much on that level. And at the time, Jim came on the road, really, because Meat was doing it, and Jim was in the process of writing the Bad Out of Hell material. So he wanted to be around and work on the stuff, you know, work, work, work on the songs on Meat, meaning he wanted Meat to be able to sing. And as we were traveling and as I was singing, uh, he developed Paradise by the Dashboard Light around me and meet and um yeah and that that was then and then we came back to new york and started auditioning for all the the uh, record companies after the lampoon show so when once you started doing the uh, working on um bad out of hell album in the studio what was it like working in the studio then with with jim and meet um well the stu we we worked just us, you know, um, say in a piano, in a room, in a very small rehearsal room with a piano with Jim and Meat and Rory Dodd, who was the, the wonderful backing vocalist. And, um, but in the studio, eventually it was in Todd Rundgren's studio in Bearsville, New York, you know, when Todd uh, produced the record. And that was, it was the first record I ever sang on. You know, was talk about beginner's luck, and it was it was wonderful. It had you know the the great band, uh, Max Weinberg, Roy Bitton, uh, Chasm Sultan, Todd, of course, playing all the um, the guitars, and and it was it, for me it was sort of like winter camp. It was in the middle of winter. We were up in the country. We were all staying in the same place, and we had a couple of weeks rehearsal which, you know, you might not usually do, you know, people would go, it, just go in if it wasn't a band. Say it wasn't, it wasn't really a band. The musicians would just show up and there would be charts and learn it. But there was this couple week rehearsal and this process whereby the musicians learned the songs, but it was more, and on that record, it was more than learning the songs. It was sort of learning the, um, the humor, the theatricality, the philosophy, the ethos of the whole thing. So everybody, you know, got what it was because it was it was something so different. It wasn't like any other record anybody had worked on before. Your performance on um, Paradise by the Dashboard Light, I think that's one of the most memorable, most explosive duets ever committed to tape. Now, Looking back on that now, in this post sort of Me Too world, how do you view it now? You know, people have asked me that. And at the time, it was a tongue-in-cheek um, 
piece of comedy uh, and plus sex romance uh, drama, but comedy was a big part of it. You know, we didn't really think uh, we were we were making out to uh, Phil Rizzuto in the background or 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 that you, you, would you leave a little, you know we were thirty years down the road. It was it was us playing characters, but I could see. I mean, you know, everything. It's it's a different world in that the sensitivities are are right on the surface now. So we probably would not be making that record now. I say that, but Steinman would probably say, you know, f this. Of course, this is this is my work, and nobody's going to tell me what to do, which nobody ever did. That's why it took like after after the recording, what a year and a half something like that to get the, the mix that Jim was was happy with. But I, I, I do think that Jim would say, well, listen, this is, this, is, this is funny. This is a spoof, but I don't know. I don't know how it would have been, it would be treated in the press now. I mean, as a 12 year old, I was, I was really transfixed on that video, you know? Um, and I had no ideas until later that uh, that was, um, your voice because I always thought it was Carla DeVito and, and, and Meatloaf. So did that ever bother you that people sort of didn't recognize that was your voice and it was, you know, um, Carla's? It was hard for many years. Well, several years, let's say, um, because it was huge and it was out there. And of course, Carla was on the road and she, she well, that's why they, they say they, they had her do it because she was gonna be the, the face of the tour and of the record. I mean, that's probably, I pro if, if I hadn't have been, you know, a 25 year old and made, I hadn't had, and if, maybe if I had had a, a, a lawyer and an agent and a manager, it wouldn't have worked out that way. But I was, I was vulnerable and I was susceptible to, to what was going on. And yeah, it, did, it bothered me for a pretty long time because you know, I knew the work was great and I was really proud of it. But as, as the years went on, you know, people, I always say that if people know me and if people know the record and they, they certainly see me now and have, I've had a history, I've had my own work and have really been out there, that if, if they want to know, they know. Yeah. You know? yeah. So I'm not going to spend the rest of my life worrying about that. And, you know, Carl and I have been, become very good friends. Um, and she told me recently that she thought that she was going to be singing on the video. Mm. She said, I don't remember if it was the night before on the way to the, uh, to the shoot, I was like, Hey, mate, I'm going to be, I'm going to be singing. I'm going to be singing. Right. And, you know, all along, they have probably been saying, oh yeah, yeah. But they say, well, no, you know, this is, this is a video. And when you're doing a video of a record, you know, it's a consistent sound and, and nobody sings live. So, you know, I, I certainly never saw her as being culpable or being, but like she, she and I sang a duet on this new album, this Fighting Words album. It's a wonderful song called, I'm Just Happy to Be Here. And there's a video, uh, we did a video of it that, mm. that you guys could dig up and it's great. And she, she's, just, she's just great. And yeah, and we're good friends now. Now, later on, you uh, a couple of years down the track, you recorded your debut album, Night Out, which is pretty much, you're pretty much known in Australia for that one, especially for the single, We Belong to the Night. Now, uh, you worked with Ian Hunter and Mick Ronson on that album. So that must have been, uh, you know, sort of a great experience working with, you know, guys from Mott the Hoople and David Bowie. Oh, absolutely. But I do say that my ignorance worked in my favor because I really didn't know Mott the Hoople. And of course, I knew, knew Bowie, you know, God. But it wasn't like when they walked in the room. I was completely uh, intimidated and gobsmacked. It was like, yeah, fabulous. These guys are great. And we're going to make this record. Of course, as time went on, uh, I knew. But mainly, I knew them from my experience with them, which was amazing. I mean, I, 
here I had a, an album with Mick Ronson playing on it. You know, ha I, I, there was a song, there's a song on the album called Don't Let Go that Ian wrote, but just, you know, the brilliance of, of the, the team, the two of them uh, combining their talents and to be able to work with them was, was fabulous. You follow up that album um, with Spirit of St. Louis. And now with that album, you actually worked with the members of Clash now and then um, hearing during the blockheads too. And I noticed that around the same time we recorded the album, the Clash were also making Sandinista album. So uh, that's another probably memorable experience for you. Yes, it, it was. It was, I, w I was like just in a different pond, you know, I, I, I really had come to Saint, to New York from St. Louis. That's where I'm from. Ergo, the name of the uh, album. I mean, in like seven years before this. And in the meantime, I'd been, I'd sung with Meatloaf. I'd made my own record. I was on television. I was on Broadway. Blah, 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 blah. And then all of a sudden I was in England with these people with a whole different point of view uh, from mine or anything that I knew about. So the making the record was a fish out of water kind of experience for me. And uh, as you know, I sang on Sandinista, which that was fun. The, the Hitsville UK uh, song is something that, that I still, I, I really enjoy. And that I'm actually gonna do Hitsville UK as a mashup <clears throat> with the song that was on the Spirit of St. Louis album called Torchlight that I sang with Mick Jones. So we're gonna, we're, I've never sung either of those live. So we're gonna, we're mashing those up for my, for uh, our next performance, which uh, will be fun. Now you've been on TV, film, Broadway. How does appearing on those sort of outlets compared to say performing rock music or performing music on stage? You know, there's a different mindset, obviously. Oh, all different, but as, um, as years have gone by and I have done any everything, I really have become uh, or have gravitated and have decided that the thing I really want to do is the rock and roll because it's what I do best. You know, I'm a good actor. I'm a good, uh, um, I was good on Broadway. I was, you know, did some good film roles, but what I think I do great if I may say it, is I keep sing rock and roll. So it's the thing I'm gonna stick with for the time, for the time I have left in, on the planet. Your, your latest album, it's your fifth solo album, Fighting Words. Now, when I was listening to it, I got this sort of sense, uh, it's got a spirit of resilience, as well as it's got a really uplifting energy, but then also got this sort of punkish sort of stuff vibe happening, you know, especially on songs like, um, I'm just happy to be here. So just tell me a bit about that. Um, I don't know about the punkish element. I mean, I think I bring, I would, whatever I do, I sing in these songs, I bring my own kind of my attitude. And if that, if that we want to call punk or I just, you know, more like the girl groups, more like that kind of attitude. Um, I'm just happy to be here came about after I had sort of gotten to know Carla again. And, you know, like I said, we really hit it off. And I said to Paul Faglino, who writes the songs on the album, who is my creative partner, I said, I would love to have a song for me and Carl. I'd love for Carla to sing on this record. He goes, well, what do you want it to be? I said, well, you know, maybe it should be autobiographical. You know, these two chicks, well, you sang my song. Da, 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 da. He said, no, 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 no. And thank God he did, because I think what he wrote was, was, um, a song about resilience and and two you know because the 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 verses on it talk about what what happened when we were young and mistakes we had made and you can see in the video there's a lot of archival stuff of of uh she and i you know from back in rock and roll times but the chorus is just like i'm just happy to be here like right now this is where i'm happy so I think it's a, it's a really strong statement about my life, her life, people, um, people who I know, people who are my age. Um, and I love the song. I, I'm very, I'm just thrilled with how it, it turned out. I'm very happy with it.
any plans to sort of, I mean, you know, a lot of, lot of artists now who have got to a certain age and been in the business like yourself for over 40 years or more are starting to sort of write their memoirs. Any plans for you? You know, um, a guy named Luke Standard wrote a book. Uh, he's, he's Belgian and wrote a book that happens to be in Flemish and it hasn't been published in any other language, but that's, that's a biography. Um, but I always say, I don't think I could write an autobiography because I don't remember enough things that happened in my life. And I'm not a great archivist. You know, a lot of people have everything, they saved everything, but I just, just don't hold on to things so much. But as I've been learning, doing a lot of interviews this last year, that I am pretty good at, 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 at um, you know, dredging up detail and, and, and remembering and having a good time reliving things when I talk to people. So who knows? But it might be more of a pamphlet than a book. 